Okay, today we start working with inverse trig functions, and it probably would be a good idea for us to spend some time reviewing just inverse functions in general. So let's recall some things that we know about inverse functions. Number one, this is probably the one um, that really helps us a lot today. They have to pass a certain kind of test. Do you remember which test that is? The horizontal line test. Now what that means is if I draw a horizontal line, let's, I'll just draw a little mini graph here. If I draw a horizontal line through the function and it hits it more than once, then it does not have an inverse. Okay, so in that case that I drew that little example, it would not have an inverse. So um, to have an inverse, it must pass the horizontal line test. By the way, another way of saying inverse is saying the function is, you need to get used to this because of what's on your homework, saying the function is one to one. Okay, that's just a little piece of terminology you need to get used to just in, in your further uh, math career fields. Saying a function is one to one is saying that it has an inverse. All right, that's another piece of terminology. The second thing we need to remember about inverse functions is that inverse functions, and we're, what we're talking about is their graphs, all right? The graphs of inverse functions are reflected across, do you remember? Y. y equals X. Across the line, Y equals X. And this will be good review for us as we head towards the end of the year. I think the best example of these two, um, you know, one of the things you're going to have to be able to do as we head towards the final at the end of the year is know your function family. So right now, if I were to state graph the exponential function e to the x without a calculator. Could you do that? So let's think through that. e to the x goes through the y-axis at 1 and does this. There's the graph of e to the x. Now we should also be able to graph its inverse function. The inverse function of e to the x is the log function, but it's technically the natural log, right? It is ln of x. And notice our reflection, this, I think the natural log function and e to the x are the best examples of inverse functions graphically because if I draw my line y equals x, it just fits right in between them so nice. Here's my line y equals x. And you can see that they are reflected. This point 1 is down here at this point 1, and there's a nice reflection. Those are two good examples of inverse functions. All right? The third thing about inverse functions is how do I find them? Okay? We find inverse functions. by switching x and y, then solving for y. And that, what that does is it helps us undo the function. Remember we talked about, for example, let's just consider a simple example. Um, if I wanted to look at y equals x plus 5. Let's talk about the function machine, our old friend the function machine. What is this function machine doing to every x? It's adding 5. Okay, this function machine is adding 5. So I bet the inverse function will subtract 5. Let's see if that's correct. If I wanted to find 
the inverse. Do you remember how we label the inverse? F to the negative 1 of x. All right, if I wanted to find the inverse function f to the negative 1, what I would do is I would take y equals x plus 5, and I would switch the x and the y. I would make it x equals y plus 5. And then we would solve for y. So I'll subtract 5 from both sides. So I have x minus 5 equals y. Well, that is my inverse function. The inverse function is x minus 5. And it's just like what we said. The original function was adding 5. The inverse function is subtracting 5. Okay? That's a very simple example. And actually, in tonight's handout, you're going to do that again. All right, you're going to get a little practice review on finding the inverse function. Something else that you're probably going to see tonight as just a point of review. Um, what if they say to sketch the inverse if it is one to one. That means if it really does have an inverse. Okay? So they're going to give you a graph like, I'll just uh, give you a basic example here. What if they gave you this graph? And they said, <clears throat> sketch the graph of the inverse if it is one to one. First off, is this one to one? Does it pass the horizontal line test? Yes, it does. So the next thing I would do on my paper is I would sketch in my graph, my line, my reflection line, y equals x. All right. And then I would attempt to, in my mind, fold this thing over, okay? So how would you do that? Well, if it's me, I would kind of take a couple points. Um, obviously, it's going to start here. This point right here would go straight across to here, maybe. This point right here would go straight across you know, to maybe here. This point would go straight across to maybe here. And so it looks to me like the inverse is going to do something like that. And this is an approximate graph of the inverse. It does not have to be perfect. But we do need to get the idea that it's reflected across the line y equals x. So that's a little review of inverse functions. Let's see how that relates to the sine and cosine graphs now. If I were to look at the graph y equals sine of x, well, I think we know what that graph looks like. It's a periodic function that keeps on repeating the same thing over and over and over again. So here's my question. Does it pass the horizontal line test? Absolutely not. Okay, it fails it miserably. Okay, fails the H line test. We'll just abbreviate a little bit. We don't need to label this graph. We just need a quick sketch to get the idea. So I bet you know the answer to this question. How about cosine? It's going to fail too. You know, we'll just draw a quickie sketch here. You know, there's my graph of cosine. I'll draw a horizontal line. Boom. It's a failure, too. Sorry, Mr. Cosine. The way you are is just not good enough. We need to change you. So, there is a solution. What if... Instead of looking at the whole graph of sine, instead, what if 
I chopped it like right here and right here. And I only looked at this part. Actually, that top part should be up there. If I chopped it off, would it have an inverse then? Yes, yes it would. So now we need to write but, capital B-U-T, don't need to add the second T, but if we restrict the domain, remember what domain is. Domain is the x values that make a function work. All right, if we restrict the domain of y equals sine of x to, now let's think of what we'd have to restrict it to. You should be good at graphing this by now. Let's consider this. Sine does this, and it also does this. Let's think of our values. Isn't this over here pi? So what is this value right at the top? The x value is pi halves. Of course, this is 0. What is this value right here? Negative pi halves. So if we restrict the domain of y equals sine of x to just this, the x values that give me just that part of the graph, then we're going to restrict it to negative pi halves to positive pi halves. If we restrict the domain to only negative pi halves to positive pi halves, then it passes. And that means that it will have an inverse. It does have an inverse then. Now, I need to kind of tweak my graph here a little bit. Maybe you should too. If I do that, then this part over here does not exist. And this part over here, past pi halves, does not exist. So if we have restricted the domain, that's the only part of the graph that I have from negative pi halves to positive pi halves. Okay. Now, let's think of cosine. So how about, this was for sine. Now let's look at cosine. We'll start off with another capital but. But if we restrict the domain of y equals cosine x to, what will we restrict it to? Well, the graph of cosine does what? It starts here, right, and does this business. All right, so this is pi halves, this is pi, and this is zero. So what do you think we should restrict the domain of cosine to? Zero to pi. Very good. Zero to pi. So we're going to go from zero to pi. We're only going to look at this part of the graph right here. And we're going to cut off the rest. Okay, we're going to only look at the graph from zero to one. Now remember, I'm sorry, from zero to pi. Remember this value, oops, sorry about that. This value right here is one. This value down here is negative one. Now, one of the things you're going to be asked to do in homework tonight is to do what we just did on these last two problems, to graph a sketch where we restrict the domain. But then it's going to say, reflect it across the line y equals x. So I want you to kind of 
experiment with that a little bit tonight. And then tomorrow, I'm going to cover it more thoroughly, what the new graph looks like after it's been reflected. Just think, I'm going to be drawing in the line y equals x. Okay. Now it's kind of, remember this is 1. Pi halves is like 1.57. So 1 is about right there. So when you draw your line y equals x, you kind of have to make those two meet like that. And there would be your line y equals x. And then you're going to reflect it across that. Okay. So just make an attempt at trying to get that thing reflected tonight. And then we're going to summarize this some more tomorrow. And we will stop there for today.